Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Marketing for Good, Thinking of Consumers as Friends. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes. You'll be able to send text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat box of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. Unfortunately, we don't share slides of the presentation. However, the webinar will be available to watch on demand via our Content Hub Exchange. I would now like to hand over to Alistair Green, who will be today's presenter. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to tune in. Um, before I begin, I want to just briefly introduce myself. So I've been an agency planner for nearly 20 years. I think I've now worked across pretty much every sector. Um, I started my career at the creative agency BBH London, where I was for 10 years as planning group head. Then I became head of strategy at Mindshare for five years. And in the last five years, I was chief strategy officer for Spring, which is a digital and content-led agency. Um, I then became global planning partner at the ad agency Gray, and finally joined Studio Boulevard just over a year ago as global CSO. And Studio Boulevard is a creative agency that focuses primarily on fashion, beauty, and premium retailers. So that's a brief sort of whistle-stop tour of my career. I think what's also relevant before I begin is I think most planners and marketeers tend to have a sort of personal philosophy or start point from which they develop strategies. I think m my philosophy goes back to my education. So I went to university in Canada and studied sociology and social sciences. And I think my background means that I tend to start with and be more fascinated and curious about people. That tends to be my start point versus brands. Um, I sometimes can find that agencies and marketeers describe consumers as if they are inanimate objects and, and sometimes forget their, their people. Um, and I also tend to view brands as living, breathing things rather than things or objects, because I think it's important to remember that brands were founded or conceived by people, and therefore, for me, they're more human than things. I think this probably goes some way to explain the subject of my topic today, thinking of consumers as friends. Um, and just before I begin, as a footnote, I'm allergic to marketing jargon, so I try not to use it. I find it overcomplicates things, but if you spot any, I apologize for it uh, in advance. So like a lot of planners, I like a good quote. Um, I particularly like this quote because I think it does a very good job of simply explaining what the essence of good marketing and planning is, which is to both understand your audience and be understood as a brand by them. Uh, the other reason I like this quote is because it comes from an awfully long time ago. Um, Seneca was a Roman philosopher in uh, 4 or 5 BC to 65 AD. And what I think that demonstrates is that fundamentally what we do as planners and marketeers has never really changed and will never really, you know, will never really change, um, despite the fact that the world is changing around us and, and people. Understanding humans and human behavior will always remain core to what we do. Finally, of course, I chose the quote because it talks about understanding and being understood as the quality of a beautiful friendship, which sort of supports this idea or hypothesis that I have that marketeers and planners should view consumers as friends. So uh, let's get into the meat of the presentation. I think if I was being objective and if someone came to me and said, I'd like you to turn one of our briefs or your briefs into marketing as a force for wider good. My first honest reaction would be, great, I'd love to do that, but 
in the real world um, and in the context of which we're all working within, it probably isn't possible. You know, unless you have a client that is uh, a not-for-profit organization or a charity, you know, generally speaking, clients need to sell stuff. Business climates are tough. They're launching a new product or a new variant. And really, that feels like a big enough challenge to meet on its own. And I think as planners and marketeers in the modern age, we're very cognizant of the fact that we need to be business focused. And frequently, being so focused on developing a strategy to meet the sort of ever pressing business needs and objectives we don't really feel we have the luxury to create a vehicle that is a force for good for our audience and for the wider world. And, you know, marketing and planning is, is it's hard enough to try and meet those objectives. And in the real world, ultimately what we do is judged based on whether we meet those objectives. And if you don't meet your objectives, you know, in today's world, your tenure on that client business, if you're a planner, might be at risk, or if you're a marketeer, your job might be under threat. So, you know, it's no surprise that the business needs and the business objectives are the thing that we sort of start and finish with. But I think the issue that this can create is that the focus on the business can detract our attention from the consumer. And I believe essentially what's good for the consumer is actually what is good for the business. And in fact, it's a better way to achieve business objectives and results to focus on what's good for the consumer. Now, for those of you who are planners and marketeers, well, you know, that's sort of obvious and isn't rocket science in any way. Um, but I think we all know that those outside of marketing and planning sometimes struggle with that concept. Um, so I think it's an important point to raise. Of course, the other benefit of focusing on what's good for consumers is it at least, at least it makes marketing as a force for good a possibility. Because I think if you were to try and answer a brief or develop a strategy without that consumer lens firmly fixed, you're never going to get to a marketing as a force for good solution. It, it will just become a sort of a distant reality. So, you know, once you've convinced your client or your stakeholders within your organization that what's good for the consumer is the most effective way to meet the business objectives, or if you're fortunate, maybe you're already in that position, then you're still left with actually what is really quite a challenging question. Um, what is good for my consumers? You know, how do you begin to answer such a big and broad and deep question um, where, where do you start? And I think we've all come across, and this is, this is a bit of marketing jargon itself, we've all come across organizations or brands or agencies who proclaim that they're, you know, consumer-centric or consumer insight-led, um, but actually in my experience, what you frequently observe is that what they do have is a very good grasp of who their consumer is. But actually, when it comes down to it, they don't really know them. And for me, there's a massive difference between knowing who your consumer or your target audience is and really, really knowing them. In, if you were to compare it in human terms, it's the difference between having an interaction, interaction with a stranger walking down the street and a good friend. You know, it's a really significant difference. And I think one of the reasons why is that our industry is inundated with tools that primarily help us to know who our consumer is. Um, much more than tools and really help us to get to know them. And from my perspective, I've really only found two surefire ways to get to know people. 
one is talk to them face to face and two spend time listening to what they say and for that reason i'm a huge fan of the traditional qualitative focus group and in more recent times i've become a big fan of social listening in, in my experience i've never found better ways to really get to know and understand consumers. I think a really good measuring stick to use to see which side of the divide you lie on is think about the amount of time you spend talking about your consumer versus thinking about the amount of time you spend talking or listening to them. And if you find yourself spending more time in a meeting room you know, presenting lovely slides about your consumer, then you're probably more in the camp of knowing who they are but versus really knowing them. And what we should be doing is spending a really significant amount of our time speaking to and listening to our consumers if you really want to get to know them. And, you know, I don't believe good marketing or planning or getting to marketing as a force for good is really achievable um, without doing that. And I think when I'm talking about really getting to know consumers, it's not limiting that conversation to your product or your service or your category or even the wider world of brands, but it's, it's really to get to know them in the context of what's going on in the world now and what's their view on the world and, and their world. You know, if you were to think about the world now, and admit, admittedly this could change market by market or region by region, but, you know, you'd probably want to get to know their views or their strengths of their views on the prevailing topics or cultural conversations of the day. So, you know, what's their view on Trump? What's their view on Brexit? What's their view on gender identity or gay marriage or the Time's Up movement or the Me Too movement or global warming or the environment? And when are their views deeply passionate and when are they more ambivalent? And I think you can sort of see that this sort of work needs to be an ongoing work stream because, of course, the world changes cultural conversations shift, people view, people's views flex, um, they react with different levels of passion and ambivalence over time. But once you've got to really know your consumer, you're sort of at the point where you need to think about how you're going to develop a relationship with them as a brand. And again, here, I think the lens of friendship is useful in understanding how you build that sort of relationship. Because essentially developing a relationship with consumers in marketing terms is the same as making a new friend in the real world. So just like making a friend in the real world, you need to think of how you're gonna introduce yourself, find out what you've got in common, Obviously, you shouldn't present yourself as something that you're not. That's not a great basis for a friendship. And interestingly, you can really sort of look at marketing and communication through the lens of friendship. So what should you talk about with your friends is essentially messaging and creative content. And where and when should you meet up with your friends is essentially channel choices and, and media. So one of the best aspects of, of having a longish career is um, you get the privilege to work with some really impressive marketing and planning minds in the industry. Um, Jim Carroll was my first boss and mentor at the beginning of my career. He was the chairman of BBH. Um, and Jim now consults and writes a blog, very simply called Jim Carroll's blog, um, which I'd suggest you all read. It's both entertaining and massively insightful. Um, when I was at BBH, Jim had developed something called the seduction model, which myself and, and many of my planning peers used. And it was really effective for clients. And I think the reason was because it was a very clever way 
of humanizing a planning construct to develop an ongoing relationship with consumers. And with Jim's permission, I have uh, taken his seduction model and evolved it into a friendship model. And I think the friendship model, as the seduction model did in its time, helps humanize marketing and planning and, and helps us as a community of planners and marketeers to treat consumers like friends versus inanimate objects. And what I've done is I've used the model um, as we go on in the presentation to help tell the story of how Studio Boulevard helped one of our clients, River Island, transform their marketing into a force for good by thinking of their consumers as friends. So now we will get into the case study, uh, which is Labels Are For Clothes. So just a bit of background for those of you not necessarily familiar with River Island. So River Island is one of the most well-known high street fashion retailers in the UK, and this year it celebrated its 30th birthday. Um, it's also a family-owned uh, business. Um, in its history, River Island has never strayed beyond uh, fashion advertising before. Um, and the challenge on the brief that we received for Spring Summer 18 was how could we increase their share of voice with a smaller paid media budget than the previous season and in a category where spend was increasing? So the brief was, was a good one because it had a clear communication challenge up front. It was pretty rational, pretty functional. Um, clearly the client was looking for a solution or solutions to that challenge. And we knew the client and the marketing organization and very much like in, in most businesses or brands, marketing is beholden to the business and sales and the business results. And, you know, for River Island, success is about getting the right product at the right time in front of the right consumer. What the brief wasn't asking for in any way was, marketing to be used as a force for good. Um, at this stage in the process, it wasn't even uh, a consideration. Um, fortunately, within what was a fairly sizable challenge within the brief was an opportunity. Um, and when we went back to the client with our sort of first strategic response to the challenge, the only way that we could come up with to increase share of voice without spending more was for River Island to increase its earned media. And the only way that we could increase earned media was to get people's attention and get them talking. And the only way we could do that was if we were distinctive. And I think at that stage, it would be fair to say that River Island was marginally distinctive in its category, but not significantly. Um, two, we needed to stand for something beyond fashion, which this brand had never done before. Three, we needed to connect with people emotionally, which also this brand had never really done before. And four, at the same time, we needed to reflect the brand because we couldn't pretend to be something or someone that we're not. And fortunately, I don't think it was necessarily the first meeting, but eventually there was agreement that that was the best way forward. And next, we were left to answer these questions, which on the face of it, at that time, we didn't necessarily know the answer to. So what should the brand stand for beyond fashion? And what would the audience connect with emotionally? What did they really care about? And because we knew at that point the consumer more through the lens of fashion, we didn't really know them. And what we needed to do was get to know them in the context of what was going on in the world and their world now. 
So this is now using the friendship model, which I introduced. So at this stage, we were in the first stage of establishing a friendship and introducing ourselves. And we decided to together introduce ourselves or probably more accurately in the case of a well-known brand like River Island, reintroduce ourselves by standing for something beyond fashion for the first time. Um, and we would decide what that something was by fa finding out what our audience really cared about and were talking about already. And we did have a brand purpose uh, that we used, which was in inspiring people to express their individuality. Now, at that time, that brand purpose was more specifically about inspiring people to express their individuality through clothing, but we wanted to now build that out and broaden it um, and to find out what the audience's views on expressing individuality were about. Um, and that really became the start point of our getting to know them. Um, and it was also useful because it would stop us from pretending we were something we were not or straying into territory that as a brand, really, we had no right to be in. So then in phase two of the friendship model, um, we got to know them. And in the process of getting to know them, it became clear quite early on that they felt, one, very passionate about this idea of diversity and inclusivity. And it seemed like this had been heightened recently in reaction to Brexit which in general they didn't support, and the election of Trump, which in general they didn't support. Um, and as a sort of uh, adjunct to that, they were also sort of tired and felt the need to challenge what they saw as outdated labels and stereotypes that were standing in the way of diversity and inclusivity. And those labels and stereotypes sort of represented generations that came before them, but weren't labels and stereotypes that they agreed with. In fact, they generally were diametrically opposed to them. And fortunately for us, they saw that River Island could play a role in this cultural conversation by shining a light on diversities, which were generally ignored by other brands they concluded because they thought brands were scared of the controversy that that might um, entail. And then we sort of got to know them further and we were actually able to get down to a list of specific events that were going on in the world now that were eliciting a passionate response from them. Um, and it was, at this point, quite a random list. But this was partially the sort of, you know, what was going on in the world at that time and their level of, of passion or reaction to it. So Trump banning transgender people from the armed forces was sort of world news and something that this group of people had a really strong reaction to. Um, in the UK, there had recently been um, a terrorist attack on London Bridge and in Manchester at an Ariana Grande concert. So there was, uh, in reaction to those, um, you know, awful incidents, there was a real sort of anti-Muslim movement in the country and hajibs were being ripped off girls and women's heads in, in the street. And again, that was being reported in the news. Um, there was the Australia, I know technically it wasn't a referendum, but it was like a referendum to decide whether same-sex marriage should be legalized. <clears throat> and that decision was very much, um, the lead up to that survey was very much uh, lived out in social media. There was at the time a lot of controversy around 
gender-free washrooms and bathroom facilities and also school policies on gender, both in terms of language and uniforms. Um, there was also, because of the season, there was a backlash against um, the phrase, <clears throat> sorry, beach body ready. Um, and this sort of idea of body shaming, particularly women. Um, and there was also quite a lot of uh, cases in the news, legal cases that were coming up about age discrimination. Um, so these were all things that, that came out of the process of our getting to know them. And that was the sort of depth of getting to know them that we, that we got to. And seemingly, as I said, it, it was like it was sort of a random list of things that were happening in the world that they felt very passionate about one way or the other. But what held it together very tightly was their desire for diversity and inclusivity in reaction to all those events. Um, and, and also the labels and the stereotypes that they saw standing um, in achieving that diversity and inclusivity. So then we got to the point of establishing a social connection, which is the third stage of the friendship model. And I think this was where we tried to decide what was the most powerful social connection we could find in this space. And actually, it seemed like focusing on the labels that they considered outdated um, and that also related to that list of events uh, was powerful because it was something that they were very much reacting against. And I think there were sort of two main reasons why we decided to focus on the labels element of diversity and inclusivity. One was it sort of gave us that rough edge and sorry that is marketing jargon and I hate the fact I've just used it but um, the fact that we were focusing on the labels which they wanted to banish and the way we talked about it was banishing labels to clothes not people just provided a little bit more tension than perhaps just uh, coming at it with uh, a positive light only or sort of um, positive slogans around diversity and inclusivity. <clears throat> we felt the labels and the tension within the fact that they were reacting against labels gave us a more specific, powerful connection to how they were feeling. And then secondly, of course, what we liked about labels was labels was something we could connect to as a fashion brand because all of our products have these laundry care labels within them. And it sort of provided for us creatively this unique voice that we could use and this language and we, we could adopt. And one of the other things we had to take into consideration is River Island is a very sort of positive, upbeat, playful brand. It's not a brand who's going to be very sort of uh, serious and political in a very sort of chest pounding sort of way. And the labels gave us the, a sort of the right tone of voice that was right for the brand, but also a new kind of voice to uh, bring into this ongoing cultural conversation. Um, and essentially it allowed us to celebrate diversity and inclusivity, which was both good for the consumer and the wider good. Um, and what we wanted to do to underline the sort of marketing for good element of it was River Island partnered with an existing anti-bullying charity, very fortunately for us, called Ditch the Label, um, to underline that that sort of marketing as a, as a force for good element and also just to um, dissuade anyone who was suspect or cynical that River Island was just jumping on a marketing bandwagon for the sake of it. So I've talked quite a lot about 
uh, River Island and labels are for clothes, but I'm assuming not all of you have seen it. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, it's not the actual campaign, but it's a, it's a case study slide, which sort of gives you a, a good flavor at least of the campaign in its entirety across all of the channels we operated in. Okay, so um, hopefully that was helpful in bringing alive the campaign. Um, I, and I think that takes us really to the last stage of the friendship model, which is, which is forming a long-standing friendship. And I think for me, I know I've put some results on the slide, which you can glance over. But the most important point on this slide is that River Island has adopted both marketing as a force for good, and also this focus on inspiring diversity and inclusivity as a long-term marketing strategy. Now, make no mistake, though, that they have only done that because we demonstrated that what was good for the consumer and the wider world was good for the business, and pretty much we superseded all the objectives um, within their brief. Um, but saying that, it an important uh, step in the process, uh, both for them and for us. I think we learned a huge amount um, in developing both this thinking and this work um, for our client. Um, but I think if I had to boil it down to the sort of really key things, it would be these six key things. So the first headline is marketing as a force for good works um, and it works for the business and it works for the consumer. Um, and it doesn't mean that right product, right time to the right consumer is no less important. And I think what we've been able to show both this client and, and other people who have followed the success of this campaign is that Marketing as a force for good can be done hand in hand with commercially driven objectives. It can achieve both. Um, I think the third point, which I think is, is a risk and maybe a warning with using the friendship model and this approach is essentially once you start building a friendship, you can't just stop. I very much like this quote. If I cut you off, chances are you handed me the scissors. And you could imagine a consumer saying that to a brand. Um, you know, if you build a friendship with consumers or a group of consumers, then you can't drop them as friends. Essentially, you are handing them the scissors. I think the other thing to not underestimate is how bold you need to be to do the first thing that you need to do in marketing anyway, whether it's marketing as a force for good or, or any other kind of marketing. Because really, I think the, the biggest challenge we always have to overcome as marketeers and planners is how do we get people's attention and how do we generate conversation? And I would say that the large majority of communication and advertising out there does neither of those things. Um, it's really hard to do. Um, and, you know, you could come up with the best strategy to develop marketing as a force for good, but if no one's heard about it or no one's talking about it, then it isn't doing any good and it's all a waste of time. So don't underestimate that you need to be bold and brave. And if you water it down and dilute it, it's probably going to fall off the edge of haven't seen it, haven't heard about it, don't care. The other thing to take into account is that there is a challenge that is going to come in doing this within your category. Um, and probably if you do marketing as a force for good within a category, you may well be the first brand that's really done it in a meaningful way. And what happens, and we have definitely seen this um, in our category and, and in, in the market, other brands 
surprisingly quickly will follow or do something very similar. So be prepared for that challenge and to have to constantly lead. Um, and actually staying ahead of the pack gets harder and harder as the pack builds and the followers increase. And then lastly, and also super importantly, is listen to feedback with an open mind. So obviously, I think as a planner or as a marketeer, when you do something like marketing as a force for good and it's successful and it's, people are talking about it and you're getting these massive amounts of earned media in response and you're getting PR and you're talking on the Sims webinars, etc. There's um, pride, but there can also be a bit of defensiveness. Like, that, you know, this is the perfect campaign. How can you possibly say anything negative about it? And what I've really enjoyed is hearing the consumer response specifically both positive and negative. And, and it, it has largely been positive, and that's great. But actually, I tend to be, and I don't know if this is a bit sadomasochistic of me, but I tend to be more interested in any negative comments because I think there's, there's really potential powerful learning in there. Because if you're trying to create uh, a marketing strategy or a campaign that's good for consumers, then, you know, you could make it better by listening to their feedback. I mean, they're talking on their behalf and they're telling you what would make it better or why it wasn't good or how it, you know, how it could be good for them. Um, so that part of the process, I think, is a, a real luxury to have when you've got uh, a piece of work out there that's generating enough earned media that you're getting all this feedback, but don't, you know, don't ignore it and don't just focus on the positive feedback, but really dive into any criticisms or, or complaints. And what we did was we sort of divided them up into themes um, and, you know, took that forward into the learning of how we evolve into the next phase. So I guess in summary, if you're at all interested in using marketing as a force for good, I think these are really the critical elements of your marketing or planning approach that you, that you have to achieve. Um, so I think the first thing you need to do is make sure that your planning or marketing is focusing on what's good for the consumer uh, and, and convincing those within your organization that that's the right way to meet the business objectives and connecting those two things up front. Then secondly, you have to really get to know your consumer and you can always get to know someone better than you know them now. So even if you think I have the best consumer knowledge in my brand or in my marketing department versus anybody else, fine. But I bet you there's still stuff you don't know. I think for the majority of us, we know who our consumer is. We have scant knowledge of really knowing them. And that's the bit that really unlocks the potential of marketing as a force for good as a, as a possibility or a reality. Um, and in order to really get to know them, you need to get to know them now. So what's happening in their world or our world now? And how do they react to that? And what conversations are they already a part of um, and feel passionate about? Um, just a footnote here. I haven't really made a big point of this in the presentation, but personally, I believe that brands or most brands aren't capable of starting a conversation. Perhaps maybe if you are one of the world's super brands who already are a part of cultural conversation, maybe. But the majority of brands aren't at that level. And I think generally what you're looking for is a conversation that's already happening. 
And what you want to do is understand how your audience feels and engages with that conversation. And then if your brand has any right to join in that conversation and then how you're going to add a new voice or bring something new to the conversation. But it's generally about joining a conversation. I think starting a new conversation is near to impossible. And then, of course, uh, I would say this given the topic of the, of the presentation is, is really trying to think of your consumers as friends and trying to think about building relationships with consumers as building friendships and using the friendship model can help you do that and helped us in the case of River Island get to where we got to um, through viewing consumers as friends and realizing that we needed to get to know them more. And that really was the point where we got to the answers that got us to marketing as a force for good. Um, and then, you know, thinking of consumers as friends um, and finding out what's good for the consumer will at least make marketing as a force for good a possibility and a reality, even if it wasn't the objective at the start. Um, but if it is an objective at the start, I don't think you can do it uh, without it. And then finally, my love of quotes knows no end. Um, I put this one at the end. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's one of those quotes that makes you feel uh, warm and puts a smile on your face. Um, for me, it's really the essence of the start of a beautiful friendship in the real world, but I also think it talks to the essence of the start of a beautiful friendship in the marketing world. Um, and thinking about uh, consumers as friends you know, makes the possibility of marketing as a force for good a reality. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Alistair. That was very interesting, and I'm sure lots of the people watching thought the same. So we're now going to answer some questions that have been submitted. As a reminder to everyone watching, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the attendee control panel. So our first question, do you, ha uh, do you think the friendship model can work in the B2B environment? And if so, how do you get to know your customers to the same extent? So uh, hands up, I'm not a B2B specialist. Um, I have worked on brands and client business that has B2B as a part of it. I've always, <laughs> I've always struggled to um, understand the difference. So I've always felt that B2B is B2C. It's just your consumers are within the business world. So you still have an audience you're speaking to. It just isn't defined in marketing terms as a consumer object, uh, a consumer audience. So for me, I, I do think that um, it, it does apply in the B2B world as the B2C world. Obviously, it's just, you know, you know who your B2B audience is. And I would probably put the same challenge to you. You know who they are, but do you really know them? And I know sometimes it can be a little bit more challenging because a focus group with a sort of business-oriented audience can be a little bit more challenging than just uh, re recruiting consumers who, who fit a target audience profile off the street. But again, it can be done and I've been a part of it. So yeah, for me, it is as relevant. And, and I would potentially argue it could even be more powerful because I think um, sometimes in the B2B world, there can be less appetite for really getting to know the audience or the consumer than in the B2C world. So I think it could, it could potentially have a transformative effect. Thank you, Alistair. 
Another question that has come through. How did you gather consumer insights in your research? Can you explain more about social listening? Yeah. So how did we gather consumer insights in our research? So uh, partially, uh, well, you won't be surprised to hear, given what I said in the presentation, we did do qualitative focus groups. Uh, we did do social listening, um, and I'll explain that more in a second. Um, but, you know, we did, we did also a lot of desktop research. Um, it's River Island's audience is fairly broad. Um, it's sort of, you know, an 18 to 40-year-old male and female audience because they're a high street brand, so they're a sort of big, high-volume, high-footfall high traffic brand, so we're talking to a lot of people. So partially things like uh, when I was talking about what's going on in the world, a lot of that came from desktop research. But then to sort of understand the level of feeling about it, that was probably gleaned more from focus groups. Um, and to get on to social listening, uh, you can do social listening when you're developing strategies and, uh, and, and, and marketing plans, or you can do it after the fact. And we did both. Um, so we used a social listening tool to see essentially what, uh, and, and you, can, you can focus on your specific target audience what they were saying or were they talking about what was going on in the world. And you can measure the amount of chatter about it. Um, you can understand who's more vocal and who's less vocal, so male versus female or 18 to 25-year-olds versus 35 to 40-year-olds. Um, that bit is very useful. And then fortunately for us, we got such a big uh, earned media response to the campaign that uh, River Island, the client, had all the social data on all the comments that were made um, on their owned platforms and also through the hashtags. So we use that primarily to help develop the next phase of the campaign, which is coming out in September. That sounds really interesting. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to, to seeing that next phase. Just you um, So another, yeah. <laughs> so another question that has come through. Um, you mentioned some results earlier about the campaign. Yeah. How long was the, the how long was the uh, the campaign um, with River Island measured for? And how often would you suggest a brand changes their messaging or their the messaging in their campaigns in a similar way to the River Island campaign? Yeah. So um, the word campaign was under debate. Um, but sometimes when you use these words, it's fine to say that it doesn't really represent what you want to communicate. But then it's very difficult to find another word. So Myself and uh, the customer director, uh, Josie Cartridge at River Island, neither of us like the word campaign because it feels like you're just doing something and then you stop and then you go on to do something else. And really, this is a sort of a long-term communication vehicle for the brand. And essentially, it pretty much lasts throughout the calendar year. Um, because their season starts in February, um, in spring, and then that would last till the end of summer, and then their new season starts in September and autumn, and then that lasts till the end of, of uh, Christmas. So, um, but we but we still use the word campaign because it's just it, it's easy, and I think we've been using it for too long. So it's um, tattooed on our foreheads. But uh, we, I think initially we took a measure after three months. Um, that was when the majority of 
the uh, campaign, as you saw through the case study video, there were many, many different elements and channels where the campaign existed. Um, but essentially across February, March, and April, that was the mainstay of the spend against the campaign, albeit there was a slight second burst in sort of April, May, June to focus on summer and summer, summer products. Um, but we have then done, since the campaign is now essentially finished, we have done a post-campaign review as well to take into account um, all of those uh, results. But the initial results, which are actually in the case study film, because award season had um, uh, before we had all of the results that came from the initial wave of results. And I think, you know, you want, you want to understand if it's succeeding or not as, you know, as quickly as you possibly can. So I'd say within a sort of, you know, eight to 16 week period would probably be the norm in terms of when should you measure it. And what was the, uh, can you remind me what the second part of the question was? Okay, so the second part of the question was, um, let me just find it. How often would you suggest a brand changes their messaging or campaign in a similar way? Right, so um, I think I'm answering, I think I'm understanding this correctly, but feel free and type in something if I'm, if I'm not. So I, I think what uh what what i'm saying is that when you adopt this model and you um find that thing that your audience really cares about that that you find a role for your brand to um be a part of that i don't think in its broadest terms that thing should really change often at all um, and should probably last for as long as your audience feels passionate about it. So to use River Island as an example, um, we are continuing with Labels Are For Clothes um, in autumn, winter, 18. Um, but I think what we sort of agreed we won't really change unless there's good reason to is a the idea of using marketing as a force for good um, b the broad area of diversity and inclusivity because we've really found a real passion point for our audience how we communicate that and express that and whether that continues to be labels or for clothes or some other creative expression of that, that may change over time. But I think the first two things, the sort of decision to market as a force for good, the decision to build friendships with your audience and the decision to focus in a broad territory that you know your audience feels passionate about and that you as a brand have a right to participate within. I think those things don't really change often at all. And I would assume that they would last years, not months or weeks or go from one campaign to another. Um, I, you know, I think if you're trying to build friendships over time and you're trying to be a brand that is a force for good, then, you know, you can't really chop and change. Um, a, it's sort of like, sort of like building a friendship with someone and then everything that you do with that person um, that you enjoy together, you decide to stop and try and find something else. And that just doesn't really happen in the real world. And I think similarly within marketing, we shouldn't be looking for that to happen. I think it's also worth noting that as planners and marketeers, we always tend to be ahead of our consumers because 
we've spent countless hours and blood, sweat, and tears doing all this thinking, you know, doing the research, doing the social listening, um, writing presentations, you know, dealing with challenges from clients or within our organizations. And so by the time the consumer sees it for the first time, we've been living and breathing it for a long time. And then they never live and breathe it the way that we do, because of course we're behind it. We've conceived it, we've developed it, we've created it, we've produced it. So, you know, it probably takes three seasons for them to get even into the place where we were by the time it was launched initially. Thank you, Alistair. I think we have time for just one more question. I think it's a fairly short one. So if someone is interested if we, uh, well, if you used um, social influencers in the campaign, and if you did, how? And if you didn't, yeah. why not? Right. Uh, we definitely did. Uh, River Island is very experienced and uses social influencers on an ongoing basis. Um, but we, it was a really important part of the campaign, and it was probably one of the more surprising parts of the campaign because it really took off um, far beyond what we had expected. It was quite a simple social influencer-based approach. So you may have seen it in the case study film. I know the case study film goes very quickly. Um, but we gave influencers, uh, I think it was well over 100, um, labels, T-shirts, which had a sort of uh, a clothing label graphic on it uh, and a blank so that they could fill out their label themselves, which we thought was a sort of great way of building the campaign. Um, a, influencers, massively flocked to take part, um, which was great and sort of uh, gave us much more than they were sort of required to contractually. Um, and it really caught on partially because you could also buy that same T-shirt. Um, so consumers, in a way, could take part in the influencer element of the campaign, which, of course, certain consumers uh, love to do. Um, and we did use a couple of, uh, so most of the influencers I would call were good spread of micro influencers. We did use three or four quite sort of heavyweight influencers, both as a sort of uh, a way to reach the audience as well as them as individuals just to kick start the campaign and really build that momentum to make sure that it sort of did go, you know, viral and crazy um, online, which, which it did. Uh, so, yeah, they were, I would say, um, an, important, an important part uh, of the campaign um, and are, you know, are a good example of humanizing something and um, the friendship model, because in a way, okay, maybe it's friendship with benefits because they frequently get paid or get product. But um, in a way, influencers are friends of the brand. And that's very much the way we tend to use them. Thank you very much, Alistair. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. I'd like to say thank you to Alistair for presenting this webinar. And thank you to everyone for attending today. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation and we'll appreciate if you would provide your feedback. On behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed the rest of your day.